um, to our guests who have just arrived. Uh, welcome. We will be starting shortly at 6.30. So just two more minutes. Again, to all our lovely attendees, just to encourage you, if you do have any uh, questions that you'd like to pose to our panelists, please feel free to make use of the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Thank you. Okay, um, good evening everyone and welcome to the second panel of the second day of the Radical Solidarity Summit. If you missed the Zahir Romani film, Seismography of Struggle, that was um, just screening on YouTube live, not to worry, you can catch it um, anytime later this week and a link to the film will be put in the chat. The title for our session today is Decolonizing Text, Future Possibilities. And uh, my name is Tandazani Dlakama and I'm an assistant curator here and I'm very excited to be moderating this panel. Um, but before I introduce our lovely, uh, our lovely panelists, just a few house rules. Uh, first of all, feel free to um, have an open mind and be respectful. And feel free to use the chat function and the Q&A function if you have a question. And um, feel free to tag us at Zeitzmarker as you post and share um, the proceedings of this summit. I'm really excited to introduce to you our three lovely panelists. And I will be um, just giving a really condensed, very condensed bios. Um, and to start off with, uh, I would like to introduce you to Nadia Davids. Nadia is a South African writer, theater maker, and scholar who focus on performances of memory, District 6, and Cape Town's post-apartheid archives in forms of critical and creative work. Her multiple award-winning plays, At Her Feet, CC, and What Remains, have been staged locally and internationally, and her debut novel, an Imperfect Blessing was shortlisted for the 2014 UJ Prize and the Pan-African Etisalat Prize for Literature and long, long listed for the 2014 Sunday Times Fiction Award. Frieda Koto is the Lorna Goodison Collegiate Professor of Afro-American and African Studies, Comparative Literature and Francophone Studies at the University of Michigan. Her early work involves an interdisciplinary exploration of the interactions among philosophy, law, literature, and African cinema. She's the author of 11 books and numerous book chapters, as well as articles in prestigious literary journals. Francoise Verges is a political theorist, an anti-racist, decolonial feminist, an activist, and public educator. She has written on the memories of slavery, South South Solidarities, Decolonizing the Museum, Amy Cizé, Franz Fanon, 
decolonial feminism, the circulation of textiles, ideas and tastes, neoliberalism and the economy of predation. Thank you so much for joining us, uh, Frida, Nadia and Francoise. Now, um, you have all written extensively in many forms for a very, very long time. Um, however, I want to start off by asking, asking us to reflect on authors or thinkers who have directly shaped some of your work. Frida, you have written texts that responded to Jean Genet's play, Les Nigres. It exposes racial prejudice and stereotypes while exploring black identity. You also reference negritude of Senghor quite a bit in your work. Nadia, one literary work that has informed your writing in recent times, and I'm sure, I'm sure there are many, so feel free to add, um, is the Rustam Kozian's poem, The Blessing. It is a poem written about Cape Town. I'd love to know why this is important for you. And Francoise, you have created and documented and analyzed the work of Amy Cizé, shedding light on the ambiguities of aboli abolitionism, colonial and post-colonial psychiatry, slavery and remembrance. So to begin with, I'd love for you to respond to why you looked at those um, other authors for your work. And we'll start with Frida, then Nadia, then Francoise. Uh, you're on mute, Frida. All right. You can hear me now, right? Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you for organizing this discussion. I think uh, within these troubled times, it's important to try to like uh, reflect on how uh, we still are humans, because I mean, for me, the question now is, are we humans really? Um, so uh, for my part, Jean Genet has been very instrumental uh, in my thinking about issues of race, uh, racism. And um, so I have written uh, a lot on his work. I wrote, uh, the last book I wrote was on his play, The Blacks, uh, Les Negres. Uh, I think uh, Genet asked the most uh, instrumental questions, uh, two questions, by the way, which color is black? Right. And uh, so that's one question he asked, and then uh, what does it mean to, you know, to be black, really? And uh, I remember when I was writing this book, um, I wanted to entitle the book Jean Genet as a Negritude Thinker. So I had to go to Martinique to meet with MSA to talk to him about uh, his ideas, what, what he thinks that, you know, Jeunet could be um, a negative thinker. I had a great discussion with uh, MSA about this. And uh, it, was so, it, so, it was so clear that, you know, at, when they were thinking about negritude, they could not really clearly articulate these questions. They were embedded in their thinking differently. But Jeunet was able to articulate them. Uh, it was, it's, it's always a question of time and space. There's the, you know, where do you find yourself at the time that you want to articulate an idea? So Jeunet was able to articulate these ideas. And I think Jeunet has given us um, a lot to reflect about, you know, the whole question of the color line, you know, uh, which, you know, we know that um, uh, Dubois has said is, you know, it's going to be a 20, 20th uh, century question, but I think it's still the question today, as we know, we're in the middle of a 21st century already. Uh, if we look at the term in the US, around the world, actually, we see that this question is still not resolved at all. Um, so Jeunet has given me the tools really to articulate uh, some of my ideas on, on um, what it means to be black, what it means to be an African woman today in the world, and uh, uh, how to <laughs> continue teaching issues of race because I think for me also the uh, you know Jeunet helps me uh, to move my thinking through my teaching because I think um, it's it's always easy to try to show to students that 
this was a white man who articulated these ideas, but they were important to him at the time where he was writing. And we also know that Genet, you know, being who he was as a, a, a homosexual white man who spent all, almost all his time in prison, he articulated ideas about what it means to be a marginalized individual in the world. So I think it's good to, you know, for students to see that you don't necessarily have to be a black person to articulate these ideas. It's about humanity. It's, it's about being who we are in the world and about understanding other people's issues, particularly, I mean, Jeunet, I mean, he was French. I mean, the French colonized half of the world and we know that. So Jeunet was also speaking for colonial subjects. You know, what does it mean to be a colonial subject and what are the implications of, of being that colonial subject in the world today. So I think Jeunet really helped me, gave me the tools to articulate some of my ideas uh, on issues of race. And of course, you can't talk about race without talking about Franz Fanon, without talking about negative thinkers, M.A. Césaire, Senghor. Um, you know, I'm writing a series of, of articles right now on M.A. Césaire and Black Lives Matter, uh, you know, Franz Fanon and Black Lives Matter, Senghor and Black Lives Matter, because I think they, they, they have uh, they articulated these ideas that are so urgent again today uh, that Black Lives Matter is repeating over and over. They were at the front, front of these ideas. They articulated them. Black Lives Matter now is picking up and continuing the struggle. So I think it's, you know, so um, basically that's... Um, mm -hmm what has informed my thinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would, I would definitely love for us to talk about the continuum of the Black Lives Matter movement um, later on in the discussion. But before we go there, Nadia, um, could you comment on um, Rustin Kozian's poem and any other literary works that have been fundamental to your practice? Thank you, um, Tanzania, and thank you to Echo Frida. Thank you very much for collating the panel. Um, that was a surprising question. I didn't expect, <laughs> didn't expect uh, to think through that. Um, I was looking at Rustam's poem when I was writing my novel and it became the spine of that particular work, but my, my interest and my affection for his work sort of predates that. Um, Rustam is a poet from Paul, which is, for those who don't know, a small town outside of the Cape, um, part of the kind of wine farm area. Um, he comes from a a Muslim family um, and when I first he was actually my tutor at UCC as well and he's a, he's a dear friend and when I first encountered his work it was startling and wonderful and beautiful for me to engage with someone who was writing the narrative um, of my city and of our shared space of our city in such a complex way someone who understood the kinds of vexed sorrows and difficulties of the landscape that we inhabit, someone who had the full measure of the complicated history, not just of the immediacy of apartheid, but of the long continuum of slavery and colonialism, um, and the threading together of how Islam um, finds its way at the kind of beginning and genesis of that, of that experience in the Cape. And there was something about this particular work that was staged as a kind of a conversation between a mother and her daughter where the mother is trying to explain to the child what it means to be from this particular place. And I wrote it before I, I was, I wrote the novel before I was a parent. And so I think in some ways brought myself into the, into the role of the child in the poem. But there, there was something about the parent trying to articulate painful knowledge. What does it mean to bequeath that painful knowledge onto your child? What does it mean to try and explain to her um, what the sissy is about? And I see that particular poem as existing in a, in a space with other works by Adam Small, by Richard Reeve, um, by other people who have tried to articulate the kinds of difficult complexities of, of Cape Town. So that, that really is, um, well, even Zoe Wickham's work, I think, does this in, in astonishing ways as well. But that's really where I find myself returning again and again, is trying to understand the history of, the, of this particular city which is a vexed and difficult one. Um, and I think that we are coming to a time where that, that difficulty is being articulated in new and exciting ways. Mm, yeah. 
And thank you for that, Nadia. Um, and I'd love for you to unpack um, the landscape of Cape Town more um, later on in the conversation as well. Francoise, can you speak to us about um, your writing and, and Amy, Amy Suze and others who you'd like to talk about as well? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Well, I do think that what connects to you, the different thread uh, you told me, you know, what I'm writing about is this radical solidarity, which is the title of uh, your event. For me, uh, without solidarity, uh, there, were, there would have been no struggle. There is no struggle today, and there will be no struggle tomorrow. And Amy Cesar, or you know, even the question of psychiatry, enslavement, and resistance to slavery are for me uh, really uh, a theory of radical solidarity. Uh, so uh, it's an archive, and I always turn to that, even in you know, because of the difficult time every time. It's always against oppression. What I like about Amy Césaire was effectively, I mean, his plays, but even the two texts, Discourse on Colonialism and his letter of resignation from the French Communist Party, because both of them, both these texts, I think, offer a theory of what, uh, of what you know, is uh, white Europe and what to do with it. It is the notion of the boomerang effect. Um, I think we may have lost her, but I, I hope she'll, uh, oh, she's back. Hi, Francoise. I think that's uh, so very important. I think well, that's good, yes. So I was talking about the boomerang effect that uh, uh, Césaire talked about in Discourse on Colonialism. And it was very important for me because it's the decolonization even of theory of emancipation in Europe that have not been decolonized, that have not uh, looked at their own racialism, uh, feminism, of course, but even, you know, as Césaire said in 1956 to the communists, the French communists, you want me as a communist, but you don't want me as a black man. And I am a black man because of history. So this is for me very important. And, um, and the question of psychiatric reform is connected with what Fanon, uh, analyze in Black Skin, Wet Mask, and also in different chapter in uh, The Wretch of the Earth or, uh, uh, you know, African Revolution. That is also the, the um, racism as a psychic uh, effect is a wound. Uh, it damaged the psyche. So it's not just uh, material discrimination. It enters the psyche and it destroys. So it's very important to have a, a decolonial psychiatric uh, practices and theory. And what I would like to say, say for me, Césaire came from a small island in, a, in the Caribbean, a French colony, slave, and then, and then today still a French territory. And coming myself from a small island, uh, Réunion Island, there is also something uh, about that, um, of, um, of uh, going, looking at the world around. Uh, for him was Haiti, uh, it was Africa, the African continent, and uh, this looking around and looking at the sea and the ocean also as a space of solidarity across that, that will circulate for me is important. And what I, perhaps the last thing I will say for me when I write is to pay attention constantly to the temporality in which we live. A past that is not yet repaired, that we are barely, you know, barely started to repair. A present that we have to repair as we go, uh, because it's constantly damaged, uh, wounded. And a future that we already have to repair because we know what the racism is doing today and capitalism is doing today is already destroying. So we have to work with this temporality that deeply question the linear temporality of the West, but it's not just, it's, it's not of the past, it's not the past, it's how do we work with past, present and future as they are entangled today. And the multi um, uh, speciality of that also, the fact that uh, solidarity, radical solidarity is um, imagining also 
the connection with other world or people that we will never meet, that we will never know, but we feel a connection with them and we feel total solidarity with them. And for me, that's very uh, important. And also the, for, um, for today, for instance, the, the, the fact that there's, um, as Frida was saying, it's very important to have this conversation because we are living in very terrible time. This idea uh, for me, um, when I look at slavery, it's the, the, that even, I mean, the repression, the torture, the killing, never, never destroy the idea that one day we will be free. One day we will be free. So that, that there is an alternative, contrary to what the West is saying, is very, more, very source of an incredible um, hope and energy about uh, what is to be human uh, outside of this. It's a, for me, it's still a, a very deep archive. Hello, Francoise? Francoise? Yeah, so I think I will, uh, I will, um, I mean, what I wanted to say, it's this really, um, it's very important. And since you were asking Nadia about uh, the, uh, I mean, statue, I wanted also to say that the first, first falling of statue occurred in Martinique, in Fort de France. <laughs> on May 22nd of this year, not in Bristol with the statue of Carlson in, on June 6th, but in Fort de France. And it was very interesting because what they put down young people, young black people in Martinique, was not the statue of a slave owner or a slave trader, but of an abolitionist, a French abolitionist. And for that, I think they really connected the past, the present, and the life they live. Because that abolitionism was in fact the perpetuation of a form of dependency and colonialism and, and anti-blackness. Mm. Well, I want to just, um, going off of that, uh, I love what you said about how to look at the past, the present, and, and of course the, the future, and thinking about how the first toppling, public toppling of a statue this year was in March in Martinique, and yet um, everyone's focus was in Europe and in, in, the, in um, the United States. So I would like to ask all of you, um, in thinking about decolonizing text, how do we deal with the asymmetry of history? Um, and specifically, uh, Frida, in your text, Race and Sex Across the French Atlantic, The Color of Black in Literary, Philosophical and Theater Discourse, you argue that history has favored Anglophone narratives. And yet in thinking about the French Atlantic, there is a fundamentally different philosophical and epistemological framework for articulations on black subjectivity through history. Would you like to expand on that? Mm -hmm. I would love to. Yeah, um, so um, I think um, first I wanna say something about uh, uh, radical solidarity. Thank you, Francis, for uh, articulating uh, what you just articulated on that. I think uh, radical solidarity, uh, Rana, is really for us to, to start articulating what history has left out, right? Uh, the official history has left out. Uh, you know, we, we, we all know that as, uh, you know, uh, post-colonial subjects, you know, we are just barely starting to write our history, and that's what we're doing now. And uh, in writing this history, I think we have to join forces together, uh, and we can only do that through listening to each other, through uh, reading each other, through supporting each other. And I think um, uh, uh, Francoise articulated that very well. So um, as, as for, for what I wrote there, I think when, when I say that uh, uh, 
you know, history has favored uh, the Anglophone subject is the question of power, which language, ha language has power, right? So all these colonial languages do have power, right? I mean, it is, uh, it is amazing that we still are using them, right? You run away from one, you, you know, you go back to the other one, you know, we're moving constantly through these languages are not able to really say what we want to say using our own you know, African languages. Uh, you know, when, when I read Gugi Chongo Decolonizing the Mind, I'm like, when and how can we really use our languages to, to say what we have to say, you know? Uh, and I think, you know, when I was, I was writing that text, what I wanted to highlight is that, you know, here I am, you know, colonized by the French and then I'm writing in English, right? You know, I'm not even, you know, I speak many African languages. I could be writing uh, in my father's language or my mother who was uh, Congolese, I could be writing in Lingala. So, and yet, you know, and that text has not been translated into any other language, right? So if you don't speak English, then you can't read it, you know? Uh, so that, these are the issues that we have to deal with, right? When we're talking about, when I say we have to read each other, how can we read each other when we don't uh, speak the other's language to begin with? How are we going to do that? So we have to start translating each other. We have to start, you know, yeah, we, we have a lot of work to do. We have to like uh, start disseminating some of these ideas here and there. That's, that's for me also radical uh, solidarity. You know, we have to like make sure that um, we're getting hold of that power that, you know, even language has, you know, and start doing the work of helping each other understanding our ideas. Mm -hmm. I love what you say about translation, um, especially thinking about um, power and why sometimes Anglophone is, um, seems like it's favored over others. Um, and, you know, a lot of people forget Lucophone as well. Um, oh, yeah. And um, Nadia, just as a follow-up question for you, um, in a recent interview, just thinking about translation, in a recent interview in which you were talking about District 6 and the Magnet Theatre here in South Africa, you spoke about how gesture in performance can transcend language. In other words, it can be a way of translating, especially, and that's important in a place like South Africa where there are multiple languages and some languages have historically been favored over others. Um, and, and then, uh, Frida, you once wrote that as a post-colonial subject, silence is part of how we are in the world. My desire is to write in my mother's tongue, but this is impossible. So I translate part of what I cannot see into silence. So I just found that interesting that um, silence becomes a way of translating, but also gesture in terms of performance, Nadia, also becomes a way of translating. And I guess it's a question to um, whoever would like to respond. Um, is performative gesture a possible, and silence a possible solution for a truer form of interpretation for today? Nadia, you start. Um, I don't necessarily think that it's about, about an either or. Um, I think it's about an addition and about having, having the the means by which to mobilize different ways of engaging. Um, and thinking about translation is not something that just exists across language, but also something that ex exists across form. Mm -hmm. And I've been thinking about this in relation, and I, I kind of, this is my segue into bringing it up, but also tying together ideas around radical solidarity. And then also Francois speaking about um, the ways in which we, we move through the past, even in the present. And as we move towards this uncertain and anxious, increasingly anxious future. I've been thinking a lot about the District 6 Museum. Um, for those who, who don't know, it's a, a museum that was founded um, in 1990 to memorialize and chronicalize um, people who had been forcibly removed from the inner city in Cape Town, people of color who had been forcibly removed and relocated. And the museum, when it first started, I think started really, that, that phrase radical solidarity keeps coming to mind because it was a museum created by the ex-community, by the ex-residents on their own terms, and a museum created through storytelling. And storytelling as a kind of an antidote to um, official versions of history. 
And of course, the official version of history at the time is the apartheid version, which was to say, this was Islam, it needs to be decimated, it needs to be destroyed, and we're going to do this as some kind of act of, of grand city planning, right? And then you would have these stories that would emerge from ex-residents, which would refute this as the official narrative and say, no, we did not go willingly, and this is not what was supposed to have happened, and this was a, this was a violation of human rights and a, a, a terrible atrocity that took place. And the reason I bring up the museum is because the museum is currently facing closure. And this is, this is a devastating um, thing. It's one of the most important museums on the continent. It's also done the work of museumology, which has radically changed the way in which museums function, um, in the way in which it's performed history, in the way in which it's returned history to people, um, in the way in which it constantly remakes the history and finds new textures in it, with ex-residents coming in and literally inscribing their own lives onto the map of the museum when you first come in. Where there's, it's amazing, there's this map in the center of the museum, which is in an old church, and people are encouraged to come and write their own lives and addresses and places of where they used to stay and where things were. And you often find ex-residents kind of contesting whether that was where the fishmonger was or whether that was actually down that road or that was where the park was. So this sort of discussion about how the map and the story converge. And the museum has received no government funding, as far as I know. And what has happened in the last couple of weeks is that there has been a coming together again of people in an attempt to rescue the museum. So again, this act of, you know, this act of solidarity um, and this act of people coming into a space to try and donate money or to try and do fundraisers, because this is, this is the way in which the museum is first founded. It was founded with people coming into a meeting with pots, documents, photographs, stories, narratives, and finding ways for these things to come together and then to be archived. Um, yeah. So I've been thinking a lot about that, about how an object is translated into a story through narrative. The pot becomes something because somebody has a story attached to it. Um, or how performance might engage with the archive of the museum. People might take narratives out of that archive and perform it. And then also about the relationship between performance and memory. That there is this kind of amazing and beautiful um, symmetry between the two. That they both occupy spaces of disappearance. And so there is a kind of a... Um, a wonderful empathy that exists between between performance and and memory making and memory storytelling. So that's those are some of my my thoughts for at the moment. But um, yeah, I, I I don't often use the word <laughs> crisis when it comes to institutions, but I I feel um, an incredible sense of sadness that this museum is having to fight to survive to survive when its people have already fought so long to have their story survive. Yeah, thank you for that, Nadia. Um, Frida, did you want to respond? Yeah, I, I really like what you said about uh, uh, disappearing and uh, disappearance and silence. Uh, so when I, when I say that I write about silence, or I am silent, is because uh, uh, what I said earlier that uh, I feel that we, what, all those colonial languages, there's always something missing that you cannot clearly articulate. There's always something missing there. And for me, you know, uh, also being an African woman, I feel that, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm constantly searching for the space, you know, the space to, uh, to, to, um, to become, a space to be who I am, you know, as a, as a woman, you know, as a subject, you know, I feel like my subjectivity is there's something uh, missing around around who I am, and uh, so most of the time, and uh, you know, uh, so so when we talk about uh, also like when I just said when we talk about translation, it's not only translation from language to language, you know, translation of forms. I mean, also translations of ideas. You know, I feel that in the continent today, we are still trying to translate who we are, what happened to us. I mean, we're talking about the past. We're talking about the present, the future, we still are in the process of finding words, finding ways to articulate those moments that our history, uh, you know, so, you know, when, when, um, when I say I can only write about silence because um, there's something fundamentally missing there, you know, that, that, that we cannot recover, 
you know, uh, you know, if we talk about recuperation of who we were, where, you know, what happened to us, there's so many pieces missing, you know, you know, so many pieces that have disappeared. How can we recover them? You know, when can, where can we start to talk about them? So I think for me is a way, you know, also, uh, you know, silence has this function where, you know, even when you translate it, you have those moments of silence that are speaking very vibrantly, you know, you know, that, that, that I think the reader should find a way to, to find in your articulation to put them out there because, you know, our, you know, I, I, I think um, our, our history is full of, uh, of holes, you know, full of uh, empty spaces that we have to fill constantly, you know. We're always looking for moments, you know, trying to like grab that little moment to like put, put it up. And so we, we, and we constantly like, I feel like there's a, a patchwork that we always like uh, trying to like, move around it, you know, find ways to like uh, go here, go there in order to like really kind of find a, a smooth surface, you know, to, to try to like be, you know, in this world, I think, you know, so yeah. Yeah, um, and thank you for that. So Francois, so thinking about museums, uh, memory, silence, um, you developed the scientific and cultural program for a museum of the 21st century on the island of Reunion. Is there a difference for you in terms of how history is transmitted, whether it's through a text, through performance, or through an object? Yeah, I mean, what uh, Nadia and uh, Frida said are very, I mean, trigger different things for me. Uh, you know, the question of absence. Uh, on Réunion Island, you had enslaved people, they left nothing. Everything was erased, destroyed. Uh, what is, was left are sometimes the tools of enslavement, the chains and everything, but not the person, the person, uh, the woman, the man, the child behind, you know. And so we decided that absence will not mean lack in the sense of lacking, you know, that because we don't have it will be lack. So we try also to dis to say, okay, the object in the European Museum is from this object tells a story. And so if you don't have an object, it's as if you don't have a story. So how do we move away from that? And we put, take the story and then we organize some form of installation because we were not uh, like District 6, which I, uh, I had the pleasure to visit. There was a lot of things lacking, except, you know, that the oldest objects are like 1930, 1950, you know, and the island was colonized in the 17th century. So, it's a, so, and then you will have what represent the island, which will be the, the house of the slave owners, and we did not want that. So we had to think, and uh, I suggested to have a, a museum without object. The point was not without object, but the point was not to start from the object because otherwise we will be looking forever for objects that do not exist. That was that, and also perhaps not also to fetishize the object. So for instance, for the Code Noir, which is the set of rules for, uh, about, you know, to punish the enslaved, we did, we did not want to look for the authentic 17th century book, you know, because we wanted to show it's a banal book of rules, of laws. And so can book and article 15 like that, what does it mean? So not, not for us Okay, I think uh, Francoise is having challenges with her network. Um, but just, sorry, Nadia. No, I'm just thinking what I wanted to respond to what, what Francois was saying and also um, I think it, it dovetails into uh, some of the ideas around, um, around translation that Frida was raising as well. It's just this, um, this idea of mobilizing silence and absence as a narrative in and of itself. And it reminds me of some of uh, Fatima Badarun's work around slavery at the Cape. 
where she talks about how um, slave narratives exist in forms in the capes that do not easily give up their stories. Mm -hmm. And that it's a matter of searching for them in a different way and understanding the kind of complications of hiding, but also the complications of our history. Find history exists in repertoire, not just in archive. Right. And so if we look, for example, at food in the Western Cape, we can trace all kinds of histories of slavery. Um, we can trace it in the way in which spices are used. We can, tra we can trace it in the way in which um, stews are constructed, etc. Um, so I think there's something, there's something so astonishing and imaginative about that kind of work, a museum that understands silence and understands absence and works with it in such profoundly creative ways. Um, and also I think would, without having visited the museum, but would invite the visitor to enter into a space of imagination, to enter into a process by which we are asked to think about what the absence is saying. Mm -hmm. mm. Uh, Thanks for that, Nadia. Francoise. Um, yeah, sorry, sorry. I'm, I, I move, you know, I'm trying to find a place in the house. Yeah, but I mean, Nadia, the, the museum does not exist. You know, the French state uh, destroyed the project, right? Ten years of work and was destroyed in one, you know, in a, in a week. And you will not even find archives online, okay? It was pip erasure. But the point is like uh, also about, about language. We we thought of putting all the language we had, which had been spoken on the island, because people came, you know, we are taken from the north of Mozambique, from Madagascar, from Yemen, from South Africa, from Malaysia, from South India, Northern India, and to hear them and not to have them translated, yeah. you know, so not to have this injunction for translation that is so much a Western tourist thing, you know, that I have to understand everything. No, you have also to think foreigner. You, we wanted to produce is the, the feeling of foreignness. There is, no, there is no reason that you have to understand that even you know, the public will have to understand everything. So for, for instance, for the Maroon and the installation of the Maroon, we imagine that will be a conversation in Malagashi because most of the enslaved were from Madagascar and they spoke and more, a lot of Maroon were Malagashi. And so we will hear Malagashi, but there will be no translation because it's what's also the language of, of revolt, of insurrection, that then the white will not understand. So there was also something that we wanted to produce of, you know, like nothing transparent like that. So uh, resisting um, this different, you know, like, so thinking about translation, as you were saying, how do we use, how do we feel free with a lot of strategy? We make visible, we don't make visible. We, make, we silence, we don't silence. You know, but we are free to use whatever, you know, like this. So we are not caught also in this uh, Western things. Speak, speak, say, speak. You have to speak, you have to say. And if you cannot use words, that means you don't know. But people speak in other languages, you know, not, I mean, the spoken. And this injunction is the injunction of the colonizer. Speak, mm -hmm. speak, and then we will listen to you. And so si not speaking is a form of resistance also, remaining silent, you know, um, not in the legal sense of I, sh I can remain silent, but really in the sense, I will not speak to you because you cannot hear me. And then you cannot hear me or even when I speak, it's gonna be um, screened through, through, through your own understanding. And so you will, and so I'm gonna get to know you. So I, what Frida was saying in, in terms of the translation among ourselves, for me is also that then um, we allow also for silence, but also we, because we speak because we, we take the time to listen to each other. There is also the slowness. Sure. That uh, translation does not always allow for slowness of time. You have to be fast, you know, the Google translation like that. And so the slowness of that, and sometimes the moment of, um, misunderstanding um, or you know we have to repeat no this is not what I meant and so on um, so all this I think we have to allow ourselves for all this uh, strategy uh, setback um, the time it takes to understand the time it takes to read uh, and so to resist also uh, the economy of speed mm. I love that to resist the economy of speed and um, I'm wondering about what it means to resist 
the economy of speech, um, thinking about Shakespeare, uh, Nadia, you, um, you were part of a program uh, called What Does Shakespeare Mean to You? Shakespeare and what does Shakespeare mean in South Africa in 2016? Um, and in thinking about decolonizing text um, and resistance, especially in the context of apartheid, um, how can we make multiple heritages work in a, how can we use text to make multiple heritages be heard? Uh, mm -hmm. And I was thinking about how in that program, John Kanye, who's um, a renowned uh, actor, uh, performer here in South Africa. Um, in speaking about Othello, he talks and about- abroad, he was in Black Panther, don't forget. Oh, okay. <laughs> he was the dad. Black Panther's dad. <laughs> exactly. Um, but he talks about how Shakespeare was used as a tool for resistance and um, how he, amazed he was to hear Shakespeare in, in Tosa, in school. Um, but then also, for some people, why should we be teaching Shakespeare in Africa? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, are you anyone? Yeah. Well, Nadia, you can um, start this. I'm not a Shakespearean scholar, but um, I, can, I suppose I can speak to it in, in performative terms. Uh, and that particular program that we did, we were trying to really, really think about the ubiquity of Shakespeare, the kind of the way in which he just doesn't seem to go away. Um, and, and there are multiple ways in which I think the work stays. Um, and part of it, according, for example, to John Cunney, is that he sees or is able to read uh, African sensibilities and narratives. I mean, I'm paraphrasing Dr. Cunney here. He's able to read African sensibilities and narratives onto Shakespeare. And I think he opens that um, particular program, I think, with a soliloquy from Hamlet translated into, into Izzy Crosser. And um, he insists categorically that Shakespeare belongs as much to him as it does to anybody else. And that when the text is spoken by him and when it is performed by him, it becomes his. Um, and that those performances and the reading of those texts have as much to do with his uh, training and experiences any other work. And um, I mean, I think that, you know, there's a very, very vexed and complicated history of Shakespeare in South Africa, not least of which the ways in which it was mobilized by missionaries to teach and educate people. But we also have one of the most astonishing um, translations of Shakespeare's work from Sol Uh So there, there is also a history of taking the work and, and using the work of translation, but also I think the, the work of thinking through how does this connect to our own landscape and what does that mean? And um, most recently, I think it was a couple of years ago, at the University of Cape Town in the drama department, um, there's a, a young and, and astonishing um, actor, Bukhla Ngaba, and she ran a series of workshops and it was the first time that students um, did their uh, performance exams of Shakespeare in Isikosa, which is, um, for me, that is a decolonial moment. Um, that is a very important decolonial moment where students are able to be examined on this module, the Shakespearean module in mother tongue. Um, so, I mean, this is not really an answer, but more a series of examples just for us to think a little bit about what, I mean, I, you know, I'm not here to defend Shakespeare. Shakespeare's fine. Shakespeare doesn't need, <laughs> I don't, the work doesn't need any kind of defense. What I think it needs is interrogation. And I'm, I'm interested in interrogating work, not necessarily putting it aside, but I also understand why, some, why there are arguments to say this is taking up too much space. <laughs> there, was something, there was something I wanted to add uh, previously. Uh, what do we think, I mean, all of us also, because I think one, one form that does not need necessarily translation is sound, in, you know, in terms of radical solidarity. They circulate a lot. And sometimes you don't understand the, the, the words, but it's enough, you know. I mean, for instance, right now in Belarus, yeah, they are singing a song from Catalan, you know, that, so how it circulates, how, for instance, reggae was very important to circulate, you know, ideas or, or even, you know, so, so I'm thinking of songs also because we were talking about, you know, in 
the circulation of ideas and words and, and, and radical solidarity. And song have been a very, very strong, especially from the African continent, moving around of a circulation of a radical ideas. So um, for me, and songs are also for me very often connected with the movement of people, you know, going out in the street and breathing again, again, the kind of, you know, that not breathing, you know, like, like is imposed by a political regime. And so the song is also breathing again, you know, and quite often um, a lot of insurrection are, have songs with them, you know, uh, if we think about Syria, Algeria, South Africa, um, Brazil. And so I was thinking about the song, you know, like, uh, uh, because we, uh, for me, they have been very important uh, for me personally. I mean, I, I think, Franca, it's such a, a beautiful way of putting it. And I was thinking about what Frida said um, earlier as well about how we're, we're finding ways to stay human by being in these conversations. And I would, I'm so interested to, to hear what everybody thinks about this idea of theatre and performativity and artistry allowing us to stay human during this time of kind of radical disconnection mm. as well. Um, and how what's missing is the, is the, the moment to assemble publicly and to have embodied conversations and that mm. to, to perform is to be human, to sing is to be human. Mm -hmm. um, and and also to be in a room with people and to gather publicly with them is to be human. And so much of the protest action around the world at the moment is, is driven precisely by that impulse mm -hmm. um, to gather and to declare I am human, but also to, to become human in the moment of gathering. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah uh, I, oh, I sorry. Just to, no, just, I just want to say that um, uh, you know, to to uh, what, what Francis said about this, you know, singing the song. I mean, you know, thanks to to singing, that few slaves survived, mm. right? Mm. Few, you know, uh, not knowing even what they were singing to each other. You know, they survived. You know, the crossing. Mm -hmm. So that's really important. And um, you know, uh, and when you can't speak anymore, mm -hmm. you sing. You know whatever comes to you, so that's really. I mean, that's that's something that uh, is embedded in 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 our humanity mm -hmm. so deeply that mm -hmm. we sometimes you know we take mm -hmm. it for granted, but it's there. Mm -hmm. So yeah, mm -hmm. sorry. So go ahead. No, that's great. Thank you. Thank you for that, Frida. Um, and this kind of leads me on to my next thought, which is on um, basically how do you continue the conversation going? Or how do we remind ourselves that this is not a new discussion? We are part of a continuum. Mm -hmm. um, what I love about this panel is that it's an intergenerational panel. Mm -hmm. um, and I know when I was speaking to last week when I had a preliminary meeting with you, Frida, we spoke a lot about this um, um, and Francoise about how, I think Frida, you said something like people just don't read anymore. But um, within your work, uh, you said something, correct me if I'm wrong, you said something like, you know, back in, back in your day, you had to read text, you had to engage with text and, and wrestle with it. But now we're just hashtagging. Um, and not, not to undermine hashtagging, but there, there is a sort of different way of mm -hmm. transmitting knowledge or, or energies. And um, in thinking about intergenerational work, you, you're doing this project called Vibrancy of Silence, um, and it's directed by Martha Gilo Kamga, and it, it engages um, uh, different generations of Cameroonian uh, women and uh, Nadia, I, I recently watched your, unfortunately via Zoom, so I lost, you know, the, the effect and the feel and the smell of the, of the theater. But I re recently watched your play, um, At Her Feet, which evokes the experiences of four Muslim women, again, intergenerational. Um, and my favorite character was Che, the, um, was the Che worshiping slam poetess. Um, and also thinking about your novel, mm -hmm. Imperfect Blessing, that is about, that follows a family through the transition of um, South Africa. And um, I reference these texts, but anyone feel free to answer. Um, 
how do we speak about this in terms of a continuum? And I know, Francoise, when I spoke to you um, earlier last week as well, you mentioned that we mustn't have despair. We mustn't feel um, like we no longer have power. And that's something you've kept repeating. So I'd love to, for you guys to comment on that. Mm -hmm. uh, well, okay, uh, uh, I can start. Um, well, so yeah, people do read and they don't read. And I, I think, you know, uh, what what has helped all of us today also is technology you know social media uh so we had the arab spring i think i, I talked about how in my own country in cameroon uh you know we had uh you know multiple revolts people you know people were killed massively no one talked about this uh, in the West, even within the South South, you know, uh, so, but we have to deal with that. But so, so but I, th I think that, uh, you know, the new generation, they, they're picking on that now, they're writing about this, right? Uh, so with social media, we have the possibility of, of instantly being connected. So that is helping us, right? you know, you, you go to a, a remote village, you find a grandmother with a cell phone, whether or not she knows us to use it, but something is happening there. So we, we stay connected without, without we knowing that we are connected, right? Uh, but but my generation, like I think the generation of, of, of negative thinkers, you have to chew the text up and down in order to make sense of it. Today we have summaries everywhere. We have hashtags everywhere. You know, so we we assimilate knowledge differently. You know, I mean, you know, we we are twenty first century. I think is a century where, you know, uh, everybody knows something about something, and uh, is helping is, is helping all of us at once. Right? Uh, we saw we saw what happened after George Floyd was killed around the world blackness around the world at once so that was really that was great you know whether or not you know um people were expecting it but something happened there so is it is it's all a diff different generation i think uh, <laughs> when, when i was talking to msa he asked me a question about what is your generation doing to make the world better this is something he asked me i always remember that 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 and uh, whenever I sit down to trying to think, I think of what he asked me, what am I doing to make this world better? So um, I think I'm doing something by, uh, you know, uh, I think I told you about this, that, uh, you know, I, I would like to keep Biawanga Wanana's voice because he was fighting for sexual diversity in the continent of Africa which is something that we need to continue doing. And I'm hoping that I'm doing that a little bit in my own work now, because it's important that we, uh, our modernity depends on having multiple voices and having multiple, I mean, ideas going. If we don't do that, then we can't really, you know, talk about, you know, our modernity within the continent. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. What I would say, like, there are, I mean, it's echo a little what Frida was saying. In fact, there are two ways of looking at it. There is the constant um, capitalist, uh, Russian capitalism production of the new, or uh, so called new, which is, you know, just commodity. And it's a technology that is new, but not the word that are circulated by racial capitalism and patriarchy. These are the same old vocabulary. Nothing is really new. It's perhaps a little. And there is also in the West, a lot of things against old people and young people at the same time. I mean, we see with the pandemic, a lot of old people are dying like alone, you know, in, 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 in Europe or in, in the UN anti-state. And at the same time, a celebration of young people, but also killing a lot of young black and brown bo uh, bodies. So there is the, the um, a vocabulary of, about the, the young and the new, but in fact, it's to preserve the old, even, you know, with the kind of body of the young body. The performing young male body 
we, you know, who go around like that and perform and effectively is totally connected. But is, is the possibility of this life rest on the exploitation of millions of millions of black and brown body, of the woman who cleans the office, of the sex worker who has to satisfy his needs, of the people who pick up everything, of the African who you know, pick up the, 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 the precious minerals so that his is, is smartphone is working. On the other hand, the question of, uh, uh, for us, I will say, it's to keep, um, and it's connect to what uh, also Nadia and Kola were saying, how do we write our own history? How do we anchor our own historicity? To say that our struggle comes very far. We have a long memory of struggle and that really that we are, you know, building up like that. And uh, so I, I trust young people with their, you know, smartphone and everything. Uh, I'm, so there is a commodity thing, okay, but there is effectively uh, the capacity of going in the street all over the place at the same time, you know, around, you know, Black Lives Matter. And so that's the possibility. So I will be more interested in, in the intergenerational connection that is made like that, that the name that comes back, you know, name of, uh, uh, you know, those who fought in Cameroon or those who fought in India, or those who, the name that come back of women also a lot of women, not just of men, a lot of women coming back through the story. I mean, here, you know, for instance, uh, young people are doing Instagram to bring back the history of the airways. Those has been silenced, but official history. So that's, for me, that's, that, you know, that's, that's good. But we have to fight the commodification of history and the, that is erasing, in fact, history. Because historicity is not good for the patriarchy and the West. You know, it's not good for them. They want, you know, the, the dead monument, the dead statue. You know, they want the dead, in fact, you know. And we want the living and we want the living memory. So I will say, I don't, uh, I trust, I trust the young people. And I think that a lot of young people are, in fact, absolutely aware that they are standing on the shoulder of other people, you know, of, of previous generation. I'm really, uh, I, I do think that. And I see it, I see some, quite often, more than the generation before them, they are looking at who are, you know, the women and, and men who fought. And not only, you know, about the big heroic struggle, but also queer, you know, lesbian, gay, uh, trans, uh, sex worker, as effectively contributing to the, to liberation. So yeah, I trust them. <laughs> Thanks so much for that. Uh, Nadia, do you want to comment from a different generation? Um, <laughs> very quickly, just to say, I, when I, um, so I came of age sort of in that in-between generation, came of age at the end of apartheid, so uh, Gen X, I guess. And when I came back from the UK to teach at, at UCT, I was so, genuinely kind of delighted and startled and amazed at how politicized this new generation of students were because in my age group I mean you mentioned the character the slam poetess Che character I mean I wrote that play when I was 24 or something um, and that was you know the amalgam of me and a friend of mine the one who performed the work and we were in a minority of young people at the time who were invested or interested in politics at all. For the most part, there was kind of this apolitical malaise that had descended around middle class kids in South Africa, um, or at least kids are privileged not to go to university. So when I came back and I was sitting in a classroom with um, students who, as Francois has described, were so alert and so profoundly invested in contemporary political questions, but also interested in excavating the history. And yes, some of it is, you know, a surface reading, they're young. Um, the depth will come, I think. But, um, and also for me, really astonishingly wonderful to see is how open young South African women are around issues of sexuality mm -hmm. and how sex positive they are. Because, I mean, I, one tends to forget because we've always had fairly progressive, radical political movements. We're a very conservative country in lots mm. of ways. And you know, we're, we're a sexually conservative country. We're conservative in terms of our gender dynamics. Um, and so to see young women taking up 
those questions and taking up the cudgels of, that, of those questions with such courage has been, um, it's really been enlivening and it's given me a lot of hope where I didn't expect it. And sometimes, you know, sometimes those questions and, and the, the ways in which they have to come to them are extremely painful because they come to these kinds of politics in a, in a violent personal way. Um, and that, that, is, that is a reality that cuts across race and class here. Okay, well, I, I want to open up to the audience, but before I do, I just want to, um, I just want to, maybe you can keep it in the back of your mind uh, for later, but like, what is the site of solidarity? Because each of you uh, talk about this possible site for solidarity in different ways. Francoise, in your text, you talk about in, in the wandering souls and returning ghosts, writing the history of the dispossessed. You talk about a space called the South and you say, for me, it is not a geographical space, but rather the historical site of the dispossessed workers, peasants, the colonized slaves, displaced peoples, refugees. Emancip emancipation is a long process in which any victory opens up a terrain for new struggles. And then Nadia, you talk about, um, in an interview you recently said that Cape Town is both fascinating and infuriating. Um, and uh, you, I, it reminds me of um, your play CC, which again looks at District 6. Um, and Frida, you t in Don't Whisper Too Much and Bona and Bella, you talk about, um, the book is about uh, the lives of uh, queer African women and you talk about the post-colonial space. So in thinking about radical solidarity, you've all hinted at, you know, what is the site of radical solidarity? Um, and then we'll open it up to questions from the audience. Oh. Whoever wants to start. <laughs> Okay, I, I think I'll start then. Um, uh, well, I think I, I, I said that earlier, you know, uh, the, the, the space of solidarity really is to reach out to each other and to listen to each other, uh, to read each other, because I, I also think that it's important that, um, you know, our ideas circulate among us you know, and reach others as well, of course. But, uh, but, you know, because of also languages, you know, this is another issue that happens, right? So, but I think we eloquently spoke about, you know, those moments of absence, silence, and uh, what have you. But I think it's, it's a, a solidarity is really to, uh, to start listening to each other, mm -hmm. to start, you know, um, when I when I'm uh, I'm speaking about listening also is um, I I really like what Françoise was when she was talking about the museums how you know we have to come up with like new ways of imagining who we are in the world mm -hmm. right I think we were stripped of mm -hmm. you know our humanity so in regaining it or in being in a new humanity we have to be imaginative, you know, uh, and solidarity for me is that it, it open up my space to, to really find ways to, to be quiet and observe and listen to the others, particularly women, I'm talking, you know, uh, <laughs> particularly women, because I think, uh, you know, um, the, if there's one thing always, uh, Missing or is is uh, the subject with a woman? You know, we we, we 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 need to give women the space they deserve at once. You know, for me that's solidarity, and uh, mm -hmm. and also you know, Im imagining new ways of of thinking how to move ahead. I mean, if we're going to talk about a future, you know, we 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 have to find disruptive ways of of engaging, you know, the powerful discourse that the West has put in place for us. You know, mm -hmm. we really, really, really have to imagine
differently, you know, uh, what we can, how we can resist it and how we can move forward. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, um, so Ritter is a space, it's already perhaps a psychic space. I'm not alone. I'm not alone. I have to also to understand. So it, this understanding that I share with other form of oppression, but also aspiration and desire for emancipation. I think that it's very important. Most, a lot of people will tell you that the moment I understood I was not alone in that situation, I got power. So solidarity is also this moment that, because we are divided, fragmented by the power, the state patriarchy, we are, you know, uh, they, it's constantly division. So we have constantly to overcome that, uh, that division. It's uh, the decorization of, of ourselves also, you know, because to effectively to listen to, to others, I think it's very important. So it's also to drop some of our ego <laughs> and to listen to the mo- and for me it would be to listen to the most vulnerable uh, uh, and uh, the woman uh, among them. So how they express uh, things. And so against a certain ideology, I mean, white feminism, but also, also to know better, you know, to speak for other. And a lot of liberation has been a little like that, you know, we know what is good for you. And we have to um, allow ourselves to be more imaginative, that I do think, effectively, the site also is also incredible imagination, incredible, really, it's a big effort now, we have to shake centuries and centuries, um, because for me, I, I realized working in decolonize the art that even, you know, the young, young black and, and brown people, people, young people of artists of color in France will constantly say what they want, but in um, being stuck to what the West has done. So we will, so the West has done that, we will do, you know, the reverse. I said, no, 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 no. Let's drop this, you know, don't even think about it, you know. So we were imagining, uh, you know, a museum, there was a museum of uh, national history of migration. I said, if we were to do that, to tell that history, our own history, how would we do it? And quite often we say, um, we will add a text here, we will do, add a, I said, no, we cannot, uh, fill up the gap of what the West has done. We have to invent our own way of, of, of effectively of, uh, with bits and pieces and traces and have fun, a lot of joy. Solidarity is joy. Solidarity is really joy, I think. It's a source of, uh, of finding sisters in the sense of, you know, and, and brothers and and really um, breaking, and this is what, for what I was saying, break, breaking the norms of the patriarchal family of who is close to you, you know, and who can be your closer one, you know. And uh, solidarity is, I would say, uh, also a form of love, mm-hmm. of loving, of loving, of being able to love. and. Uh, um, and love outside of a narcissistic, egoistic, possessive love. A love that goes beyond that, uh, a form of, you know, uh, what some black feminists has called revolutionary love, you know, but we could call what, but this, yes, the um, loving, I think very, very loving is, is absolutely um, not, we have to love, we, because, the world that has been constructed by the West and, and the white West is a, law, is a world of hatred mm-hmm. and, and, and meanness and, and, and brutality and cruelty. And love will effectively be important. But we have also to give meaning to that love. And it's not the love of the narcissistic, egotistic, possessive love. Mm, that's amazing. Um, I think our audience are dying to ask questions. <laughs> um, and I want don't to die, don't die. <laughs> um, no. In trying to honor them, um, uh, Michael, can you please um, ask, um, let us know what questions are coming from the audience? Certainly. Um, we have a question from Paneth. Uh, do you think the summit could influence somehow 
the African countries to better understand and invest on, in arts and culture as a factor of peace building and humanization once again after this global crisis. And I think that's to the panelists. Okay, so whoever would like to answer that. Nadia, you have not spoken. Nadia. Nadia. I have no idea. So I, <laughs> I, I, I plead not knowing. I'm hopeful. I think it does. I think we have to be piece in pieces. I think it does. I mean, I think the Radical Summit and all the initiative and projects that are being done all through the continent are incredibly uh, important. And uh, all this cultural and artistic uh, discussion or, or form and that goes very deep and are political in the sense of transforming. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, as, as Frida said many, many times and even Nadia said, you know, like we have to invent what is to be human in the world. Well, uh, and we are inventing it. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I borrow um, uh, Senghor's words, art, we save the continent of Africa, if nothing else. So I think our leaders need to hear that and they need to invest more and they need mm -hmm. to allow the young people not to keep their creativity because they're really creative. And mm -hmm. so art will do the work mm -hmm. for us in the continent. That's great. Um, next question, please, Michael. About reading and translation, you've mentioned other forms of knowledge like music and performances. We do know that, uh, that there's a lot from Africa that is part of what we have called oralities, which also needs translation on one side. But also the knowledge that you yourselves are producing using a form that is not directly accessing all kinds of audiences, specifically the young generation audience. So my question will be, how do we engage in translating both for speaking, sharing, and transmitting in a way they can also work together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think I touched on, on this a little bit already at length, but um, I don't know, Frida and Franco, were you about to say something? Yeah, I, 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 I try to experiment for workshop a lot. I also, for instance, sometimes speak in a you know, school where there are 10 year old kids in front of me about uh, you know slavery and i have to say you know i spend the night thinking oh, i'm going to do that uh, so i i don't arrive so i think it's uh, i mean for me for me it, it's really uh, to rethink the question of pedagogy and to 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 draw from you know paulo ferreres tibico i mean so many people from the global south have written about pedagogy and so to really um different methodology of a transmission and, and a rethinking school and rethinking education that are, I don't know, but in a lot of part top down, not listening to kids, not letting kids having their, you know, imagination. And for the workshop I have done with people who, I mean, when I'm not speaking like we are speaking now, uh, it's really interesting. It's really interesting. And it's, it's really possible. I mean, it's, it, it's a, but it takes time. And again, for me, it is a question of time. That, uh, that then um, this pedagogy will not uh, uh, have for objective, you know, examination, you know, uh, grade and everything, but really um, learning. I mean, I think we have to read all this, you know, uh, text, pedagogical text from the, uh, coming from the South. And today, you know, what is written about queer pedagogy, uh, uh, indigenous pedagogy, I think, are there a lot of tools out there to answer the question, you know, of how do we do? Um, Nadia, do you want to respond? Um, and Espida, are you going to, are you going to? Um, well, just to say, I mean, I think for me, this is the kind of the one space where I really think theatre comes into its own 
in a very, very powerful way, particularly the ways in which South African theatre has developed. Um, I think about the work of like John Kanye and Winston Shona, uh, those sort of beginning days of the market there, so where um, the work is made and then it's distributed and that it's operating through different circuits of knowledge and that these are works that are deeply invested in the political and that that theater tradition goes on the idea of a stripped down Grotowski-esque stage where anything can be staged as long as there is a torch and um, saying that my connection's unstable, it's okay. As long as there's some sort of light and some sort of space in which to speak, um, if that place is opened and if it's made and if, they, if there's a way of reaching an audience. I think, for example, the Magnet Theatre plays, which is the one you, you brought up earlier, which was the one was, um, with the use of physical theatre and dance and the transmission of gesture. That particular play worked with the archives of the District 6 Museum made a piece of work that was almost entirely out of physical theater. So it was about the language of the body and the body being able to speak and the body being able to transmit a story. And it was the kind of work that could be shown all through the country um, at, to schools, to kids from about 10 years old, all the way up to kind of paying audiences of adults. And for me, it's about trying to find a way of telling a story where it's mutable and it's relatable and it can be found, but the aesthetics and the intellectual and political work of it is not compromised. And I think that there are ways that that can be done. Yeah, I, I just want to say that uh, storytelling mm. uh, is, is something that mm. uh, we have to go back to, telling mm. stories to our children, our stories to our children, you know, uh, going through ancestors, you know, they have ancestors, they should know those ancestors mm -hmm. and what the ancestors have done so that they are standing uh, mm -hmm. and then they're going to grow stronger. I think it's really important that we keep the line of storytelling and remember our ancestors all the way. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, uh, maybe one more question, Michael? Um, this is a question towards, or it rather says, uh, taking it from Francois's idea on, op, on the objectless museum and on absence, what could be done in this vein to save the District 6 museum? Um, yeah, this person says they don't know much about the museum, but they have checked it out and they were very moved by it. So. The question is what could be done to save the District 6 Museum? Um, Nadia, do you want to answer? Since yeah, just very briefly to say, I think they just, I think they need money. They need funds to stay open. They need to be able to pay their staff. I mean, at this point, it's, a, it's, it's about kind of tangible contribution, I think, in that sense. Um, they, you know, they have the programs and the imaginative curatorial work. Everything is there. Um, it does incredible outreach stuff. It's also, it, you know, it's not just a museum in the traditional sense of the word, and it's not just sort of an archive for storytelling. It's also a place in which people gather in, in order to mobilize to do land reclamation. So it operates on, on multiple levels. And in that sense, it's essential, not just in terms of um, keeping some sort of historical repository, but, but also as a space of active citizenship and of holding government accountable for that process of, of land redistribution and claimants, yeah. Well, I, I will also want to say that um, the economy, I mean, make all our projects very fragile. You know, publishing house which has to stop, uh, space which have to close, uh, you know, it's the fragility in which our um, our, a lot of projects, and we could uh, list a lot of them that had to stop all over the, you know, through history. And so how to, do we deal with this fragility, with this vulnerability, which is constantly produced uh, by, you know, in, in, in Paris, one of the most important space to discuss La Colonie, uh, mm -hmm. created by the artist uh, Kader Atia, has closed because of the pandemic and no money. It's, it's a terrible loss. It's a terrible loss. So there is also uh, the, the, how, you know, the, the, the 
patriarchal and capitalist economy exhaust us also, you know, and how do we have to deal with this economy of exhaustion that constantly looking for things, constantly rebuilding, constantly, and, and also saving so, so, so many things. And so I don't want to underestimate that, and, and, uh, but also to how, what kind of economy we're going to find that will uh, help, you know, archives that are being uh, lost because there was no money to save them, you know, and I visited some on the African continent, they are eaten by, you know, whatever, or they're, it's, it's, a, it's really something we, I mean, um, um, of course there is digital to save things, but we cannot all, you know, be, uh, I don't, I mean, District 6, I, again, I say, wish I visited, and for me, it was a very, uh, an important model uh, for the museum when we thought of the museum in Réunion Island. And uh, it's uh, terrible, it's, it's terrible to think about that. So of course we can contribute uh, to the, you know, funding uh, campaign, but at the same time, you know, in every day there is a, 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 a thing that is, so how are we gonna do, you know, how are we gonna do? So but perhaps to go back to what Frida was saying, I mean, when the government will give more money to this, to art rather, and culture rather than to arms, you know, than, mm -hmm. rather than to buying arms that, uh, that to, you know, to, uh, I mean, with one plane that they are buying, you know, one, one uh, bombing uh, plane, uh, you can finance uh, 50 yeah. district seats. Yeah. That'd be nice. Yeah. <laughs> um, so just, just to sort of end, um, I'd like you all to very briefly, as, as we close the session, um, think about or reflect on what are practical acts of solidarity. And this is what I've captured so far from your discussion. And I just want to know, is there anything you'd like to add? So this is what I've captured um, in terms of solidarity. Silence is a form of resistance. Support each other. One day we shall overcome. Um, you can't kill an idea. Museum, create museums on your own terms. Translation of ideas um, doesn't mean you have to speak. Sound doesn't always translate. Invent your own way. When you can't speak, sing. What, you are doing to what are you doing to make your world better today? Give women space. Drop egos revolutionary love, know your ancestors. Um, as we close off, we've got two more minutes. Is there anything else you'd like to add in thinking about radical solidarity? Keeps, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Uh, yeah, keep spreading love and uh, strength and uh, keep thinking about uh, the next generation for me. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Um, invent new way also of protection. Protecting has to be, a, you know, an anti-racist uh, politics. We cannot give it to the state. Protecting the world, repairing the planet in our own terms. Um, solidarity is the place where the stranger is welcome and that one has to dig deep to welcome the stranger whether the stranger is dead or alive and I think that's important too solidarity is also about listening to the dead and allowing oneself to hear their stories um, and also I would say solidarity is about not only expecting people who are suffering or oppressed people to do the onerous work of dismantling oppression. Mm, that's great. Wow, um, that's a lot to take home. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Nadia, Francoise, Frieda. I had, I had a whole page of um, interesting questions that we didn't get through, um, but that's for another time. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and that marks the end of our session. Um, but to our audience, just a reminder to, um, that we have one more session 
uh, to close the day, and that is a reading. I will be reading. And Freda, you mentioned Binya Vanga Wainana. I'm reading two texts by Binya Vanga Wainana at 10 past eight. Um, so please do join us again. We're going to take a 10 minute break and at 10 past eight, um, please come back for our reading. And please feel free to um, comment and give us feedback on our social media. Just tag at Zeitsmoka. Um, thank you once again. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you. It's amazing. Thank you. And thank you, Francois. Thank, thank you, you Peter. It was wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. much. See you, Francoise. Bye. See you, Frida. Nice Bye -bye. to meet you, Nadia. Nice, nice to meet you to both. You. Wonderful and honor. A privilege was mine. Thank right. you. And uh, good luck oh. for District 6. Tell us Thank what, you. Can, what we can do. The, no, I, I feel like I've become a spokesperson, but I've just, no, 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 we <laughs> I'm just a very you. invested um, attendee. So, yeah. Thank you, Francois. Go well. Stay safe in New York. Bye.